Welcome to Roger That, a podcast presented by HVAF of Indiana. I'm your host, Lauren Carpenter, and join me as we discuss how HVAF is ending veteran homelessness and how you can join us in our mission. We'll be having conversations with community partners, staff members, and even some of the veterans we serve. We hope sharing more of our story with supporters like you can shine a light and give a voice to this vulnerable population, because no hero should ever be homeless. Before we get into today's episode, here's how your support helped Hoosier Heroes last month. In April, 109 veterans received temporary housing and 103 veterans received rent and utility assistance to prevent them from becoming homeless. Nine veterans were enrolled in our employment services, and these services include resume help, interview training, and job referrals. And seven veterans landed a full-time job. 236 veterans visited our pantry, where veterans received essential food, clothing, and hygiene items. And so far in 2024, we have served 837 veterans, and we know we couldn't serve this many Hoosier heroes without your support. So thank you for donating, volunteering, following us on social media, and being a part of the Roger That community. The month of May is Military Spouse Appreciation Month. According to the United States Military Spouse Chamber of Commerce, There are 12.2 million military spouses, including the spouse of a veteran or currently serving member of the U.S. Armed Forces. And there are 1 million spouses of currently serving active duty, guard, and reserve service members. 624,000 of these are active duty spouses, and 372,000 are selected reserve and National Guard spouses. And three of those 12 million spouses work here at HVAF. Not only do these women serve our veterans on a daily basis and their roles at HVAF, but they have taken the call with their husbands to serve our country. Today, you'll hear from HVAF CEO Emmy, whose husband is currently serving in the Indiana Army National Guard. You'll also hear from HVAF's VetWorks coordinator, Kristen, whose husband served in the United States Army. And you'll also hear from HVAF's community engagement coordinator, Andrea, whose husband is an Army and Air Force veteran. These women have amazing stories to tell as they share why they're proud to be a military spouse, share some real honest truths about the day-to-day life of being married to someone who's currently deployed, and give some encouragement to spouses who currently have a spouse serving in the military. So without further ado, let's get into my conversation with Emmy, Kristen, and Andrea. Welcome, ladies. Hi, Roger. That. You have all been on the podcast individually, but not all together. So this is exciting. It so is. We're going to talk all uh, things being a military spouse. It's interesting because I feel like a lot of your stories are similar, but also pretty different, too. So I think it's um, be cool to hear your guys' perspectives. I'm not a military spouse, so I have a lot to learn. So let's get... So do I. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we'll go ahead and get started. Just if you want to share um, your name and your husband's military branch and the years they served, just like a little bit of background on that. And um, also what you do here at HVAF. It'll help too. And if they're not watching the podcast, listening, they can kind of like see here, hear which voice is, is whose. So. All right. I am Emmy Hildebrand. I'm the CEO here at HVAF. My husband, Jay, is currently serving. He's full-time in the Indiana National Guard. Um, He just actually finished his 20 years of active service. So uh, he's a major right now, hopefully promotable soon to Lieutenant Mm -hmm. Colonel. Awesome. Andrea? Uh, My name is Andrea Carlisle. I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator here at HVAF. Um, my husband served, he's not currently serving, but he served for 12 years, um, four years Army active duty, and eight years in the Air Force Reserves. And I think, I couldn't tell you the exact years, but I know it was like 98 was when he started. Awesome. Kristen? Hi, everyone. My name <laughs> is Kristen Birch. I am the coordinator for a program called That Works that is under the Workforce Development Umbrella. It's a grant uh, from the Lilly Endowment Initiative to upskill our veterans. Um, That's not a plug. (laughs) (laughs) But my husband, um, I'm a little farther removed, probably I'm a little older, but um, so my husband was five years in the Army, Mm -hmm. and then he was 16 years Army Reserve. So um, we've been married 24 years, and he retired when our daughter was four. So it's been, I mean, he retired from the Reserve, Uh so it's been a little while. Yeah. Yeah, well, and thank you all for, you know, your husband's service, your service, and, you know, there's it's definitely a sacrifice for you all as well. So let's take it back to, you know, first when 
they get the call, right? So Andrea, you were only 20 years old when uh, your boyfriend at the time, Wes, he uh, found out he was going to go to Germany. So what was that like, just finding out that he's going and what happened next? Um, So first of all, I was like kind of excited because I had taken three years of German in high school. So I was like, you were just set up. You knew. I was like, I already could speak the language fluently, like (laughs) I thought, but not really. (laughs) But um, actually, the first thing we did was was like, what are we going to do? Because I couldn't go with him if I wasn't married. Mm-hmm. And so um, I remember, can I tell my little story? Do you guys want to hear it? Uh, sure. At all? I definitely. Okay. <laughs> so um, I remember I, he t- told me the news and I was like, oh my gosh, Wes, what are we going to do? I probably said it just like that. <laughs> and he's like, um, I'm like, he's like, well, you know, we, we have to be married. And I'm like... Oh, wow. And I'm, and he's so right then and there, he got down on his knee and he asked me to marry him. And I was like, we don't even have a ring or anything. And then he pulled out a ring. So he had been planning to propose when he dropped the new, the, you know, the information about the news of Germany. So it was pretty exciting. We planned our wedding in three days um, because we had to be like married before he could go the next Monday to yeah. get me put on the orders to Germany. So that was kind of a whirlwind, if you can imagine. Yeah, definitely. You know, and so how long were you in Germany? Three years. Three years, yeah. Yeah, yeah what um, what was that like then just going straight from you're here in the States and then the next week you're in Germany? So that was crazy. Um, I was also very young. So yeah. um, I was like newly married, new to military and new to a foreign country. And I was 20. So it was a big time shock, culture shock. Um, And so the first year was kind of hard. Also, like he was gone a lot. Like he had to go to trainings in this place called Grafenwehr. And he'd be like gone for like two weeks at a time or a month at a time. So that was hard. But then one day I was like, I got to put my big girl pants on and enjoy this time. And so the last two years we were there, like I absolutely loved it and didn't want to leave. Like yeah, you're living your best life. You yeah. went to a lot of places. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. No, that's cool. Yeah. And Emmy, when you met Jay, he was already serving. Mm-hmm. So, you know, going into that relationship, you would know that's going to be, there's going to be a lot to commit to and, you know, be okay with. So like, like for me, I remember I was dating someone they thought about going into the military and I thought, no, then I won't be dating him because I don't want to go through that. Obviously he wasn't the one. Um, so how did you know? Like, be okay, I guess, be okay with that and just, you know, yeah, go into the relationship knowing that. So I guess I'll start by saying I don't think you ever really know what it's going to be like. Um, sure. I met Jay through uh, friends that were military as well, and it was just mm-hmm. his job. Um, mm-hmm. So that's what he did during the day um, in one weekend a month and two weeks out of the summer. Um, so I didn't really think about what would really be required. Um, right. I think we met when I was 29, and I don't think we spent – one of my birthdays together until I was in my mid thirties. Oh, um, wow. And that okay. that's the kind of stuff that you don't know is mm-hmm. that they are away a lot. Um, even when they're, you know, um, full time in the national guard, they miss a lot. Um, it's hard on your family. It's mm-hmm. hard on your kids. So I don't think you can really ever know that going in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And um, Kristen, when you met Neil, he was in the reserve. So what, I guess just for someone who's not familiar, what does that mean to be in the reserves? Yeah, so for the Army Reserves, Neil was uh, one week in a month and gone two weeks out of the summer for annual training. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't over commitment, really, and he was never called up for active service during that time. So it, w- it was much easier than someone who has to deal with lo- lengthy periods of time. Yeah, and so for him to have already been active duty, how would you say then, like, that affected your marriage at all did you seek out that kind of get brought into yeah in in many ways Uh um honestly so when we first met we were both working part-time at FedEx Mm -hmm. we're in school um working nights um and he he had he had just really honestly almost gotten out of Mm -hmm. active service um and like we see here at HVAF he was a little lost Mm -hmm. floundering a little bit honestly um when you're when you're in the service and you have big boy jobs and you're told what to wear and do and eat, it's very plain and simple in that, in that way. And then when you get out, it's what am I, it's a void really. Mm -hmm. Um, So um, it did 
caused us to break up and mm-hmm. we spent a lot of time apart um, and time means everything, you know, mm-hmm. so um, he figured it all out. Luckily, I yeah. mean, um, we're blessed that, you know, he got it, you know, figured it out what he wanted to do and on track with what he had done in the military, which was a lot of uh, training. Mm-hmm. Um, so he stuck with that and was it became a trainer at FedEx. So, um, but also <laughs> the other part of that is, um, and you guys could probably speak to that because, um, things are very black and white when you're in the military. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's the mindset is different. It, you can be a little closed minded. Um, yes or no mm-hmm. <laughs> black, white type thing. Like I said, so, um, also my husband is a military brat. Yeah, yeah, and his his father was a career um, army mm-hmm. lieutenant colonel, um, and that has a huge impression on a child. Um, so he grew up in that same mindset mm-hmm. of things are done in a particular way, things are neat and orderly, and this is how it is. Yeah. So um, I think that is something that you have to kind of work through as a couple. Yeah. Yeah, and so how, how did you work through that? Uh, patience. <laughs> <laughs> Similar um, yeah. argument. No, I'm just, uh, <laughs> well, I think like any any new marriage or, or you know, that you're going into, there's struggles. Um, mm-hmm. But I trying to work with that of just, okay, wow, that's not the way I see the world. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, it's totally different now. That's, the, you know, when you're newer out of that mindset and having been raised that way I think it can challenge challenge a different view a lot Mm -hmm. um a lot of times like I've said before um some of our veterans tend to be a little stubborn Mm -hmm. and avoid they don't necessarily like it they're authority figures or um being told that they're right wrong so um it, it it definitely it was a struggle for sure yeah I think that's really interesting that your experience with your husband is, it helps you in your job now with helping veterans and being yeah. able to understand kind of where they're coming from. Right. And yeah. And I think it's a fine line because you want to support mm-hmm. and, and be a cheerleader and, yeah. and all that, but you don't obviously want to coddle someone. Either. Right. Right. You're, you're trying to help them find a path um, and try to slowly push them through it. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so you, you kind of be respectful and, and try to be patient, but we have to keep moving forward. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, Andrea, when um, you know your husband was deployed twice, yes, okay. And uh, so, could you tell us a little bit about you know his his deployment, kind of where he went, and how that then how that was like for you as well? Uh, yeah. So the the first deployment was um, when we were we just been married three years, uh-huh. and so he went to Iraq. Um, We were stationed at Fort Carson, Colorado. Mm -hmm. Um, So, like, they have, like, these groups called uh, FRGs, and it's family readiness groups that are, like, supposed to, like, support the wives and spouses while your your, your partner is is deployed. Um, But I didn't really get with them. I don't know. I just ended up going back home for the summer while he was deployed to Iraq. Um, that was really hard. Um, so I was still very young. I was just like 22. When, and um, at that time, they didn't have 18, they didn't have phones. So we didn't, we weren't able to communicate um, for five months. Wow. So um, that was when the war first started, 2003. And so, um, yeah, that was, pr- that was one of the hardest times, actually, for me. Um, I remember like, just, <laughs> just like, always wondering where he was and things Mm -hmm. like that. And then um, I remember the first time I, he called me, I was actually working as a server at Red Lobster (laughs) and they got me, it pulled me off of the floor and was like, Oh my gosh, your husband's calling from Iraq. And I almost passed out because I hadn't talked to him in five months. So we would just write letters back and forth. Um, But then you could only talk for like five minutes Mm. because, um, (laughs) because they had a long line of right. soldiers. And so you'd be like, just talking, and then you have to go, I have to go, and it have to be like another week before mm-hmm. you could talk again. Um, so that was that was really hard. Uh, the second deployment was uh, non-combat. So he had full, like he went to Guam. So it was really a vacation for him. <laughs> <laughs> I 
um, he like is sending me pictures of like sea turtles and um, like the reef. He became a master diver while he was in Guam. Oh wow! Um, and I was at home with the kids. Nice. So I yeah great. <laughs> So that was totally different. I could talk to him every day and Yeah. Um a little easier for you. Yeah, it was yeah, it was like, you know, so it was more normal. But it was still six months. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that's a really it is a really long time to be apart from your spouse. And the first time he was deployed it was like nine months. So Yeah. Is there any like support for that for like the spouse whenever he was gone? Like or like were you able to like especially being on the base in Colorado, like yeah. Were you able to talk to the other wives yeah. there and yeah they did they tried to like that's why the frgs they they try to keep you like together and mm-hmm. and stuff but but i'll be real honest like i i just like to get like support at the time i just relied on like my church and things mm-hmm. like that um because we weren't on the base we weren't we we lived off off the base off post mm-hmm. um so like i just I, I went to a church there in colorado and you know, I got involved in that and things like that. So I didn't really get with the FRGs, but I did when I was in Germany. Mm-hmm. Because obviously in Germany, you don't, you can't really, I mean, you can make, I did make friends with a German, one German lady. Her name was Sabina. But you can't, I mean, it's not this, like, it's hard. I did connect with the FRG, like, mm-hmm. there. So, um, yeah, it was, it that was good. We got, we got together, like, once a week. Yeah. And scrapbooked. Yeah. What was, um, I guess maybe the first deployment, what was that like when you came home? I read this article this week when I was researching for this interview that it was like, you know, how it can be awkward when the spouse comes home after a deployment, like that there's, it's like almost having to like start over and try to find conversation. And especially if, you know, they're bringing home PTSD and other things like that. Um, so I guess, I don't know if you experienced that or just kind of what that was like. So when he first got home, it was like it wasn't even real because he'd been gone for so long. Um, I remember I was telling you earlier that the first thing we did, we went and saw Lord of the Rings, Return of the King Mm -hmm. at the theater in Colorado. And I remember just sitting there and just like staring at him like, and I remember him like whispering in my ear, it's okay, I'm home now. Mm -hmm. And I just was like, so like, I just couldn't believe it. And um there was this song is like you raise me up. I don't know if you know it by Josh Groban. Oh yeah. So that song played at the theater, and I like every time I hear that song, it takes me back to that moment. Mm-hmm. Um, so that that was amazing. But then of course, like you get yeah, you have to readjust to like because the spouse takes care of everything while they're deployed, like the finances, every all the decisions, everything because they're deployed doing their job. Mm-hmm. so there's a lot of things you have to like readjust to when they come back because like they like to want to like they're they're used to being in charge they're used to doing their thing you're used to doing your thing so you got to kind of come together and be like okay how are we going to share these responsibilities now that we're now that you're back home right and that isn't that is an adjustment yeah I mean I know you have also experienced deployment mm-hmm. and so um ironically when you started here um that Jay was deployed in Afghanistan. So how has that been for you guys whenever he's been deployed? Um, so I guess I'll, I'll back it up and say we're about to celebrate our 13th anniversary. And um, he at the time that we got married, uh, mm-hmm. he was in a unit that had uh, two people uh, in similar positions as him. Mm-hmm. And uh, they were supposed to mobilize like the Sunday after our wedding. Mm-hmm. And I remember talking to somebody in the unit, like if, if Jay gets off this appointment, he will go soon. Like, just know that. And I kind of put it out of my head. Um, at the time, I worked for Senator Luger, and um, I had the honor of representing the senator at um, several military funerals for um, individuals who've been killed in Iraq and Afghanistan. And so uh, I had seen all of those widows up close and personal and, you know, tried to convey our sympathies to them. Um, and words were never enough, and it, it always felt empty. But um, so when he did... Um, get deployed, I was terrified. Mm -hmm. Um, I knew I didn't have the strength that any of those widows had that I had talked with. Um, And so I was probably not a great military wife um, because I I was very worried. Um, I actually talked with somebody who uh, 
I didn't know, saw me drop off Jay at Camp Atterbury to go to Afghanistan. And he said, you looked so terrified and so worried. And I didn't know how to deal with my friend looking like that. Um, so it was hard. Um, it was also hard uh, because it was 2012. So um, Senator Luger was up for re-election and we lost. Mm. Um, and my husband was not here. Yeah. Um, so we missed our first anniversary. Um, just just tons of stuff. Um, it was really hard on the kids. I remember uh, he's, um, the twins were just three, I think. It, mm-hmm. Chloe was six. And he had been deployed um, in 2008 to Iraq. So Chloe could remember that. Mm -hmm. And so when he sat her down and said, hey, Chloe, I I have to go, she, six-year-old, just hung her head and said, again. Mm -hmm. Um, So it just was a whole year of just kind of upheaval um, and then just the professional upheaval too. So when I landed here at HVAF in October, um, I was really grateful um, for the the CEO at the time um, understood that my husband was gone um, and that it was really important to me to connect with him. Um, mm-hmm. Sort of very different from Andrea and probably really great for my uh, mental health. Um, Jay's base had Wi-Fi. Oh, nice. nice. Um, so, and, and this is 2012, so significant yeah. advancements from um, the um, 2002-ish era. So um, I had just gotten an iPhone, but we could FaceTime Mm -hmm. um, and iMessage over Wi-Fi. So um, again, kind of back to that fear I referenced earlier, um, Jay was really good about checking in with me. Um, I think we talked almost every day Mm -hmm. um, because I was just so worried um, that he would not be okay. Um, So I, again, I was really grateful for the support that, that was here. Um, I, um, Afghanistan is an eight hour time difference. Mm -hmm. So there were, um, several days where I just was able to close my door for a half hour, 45 minutes, talk mm-hmm. to my husband and, um, everybody understood that. That's great. Yeah. How, um, does, you know, being a military spouse then affect your work here at HVAF? I think I have a lot of sympathy for, um, people going through hard times. Mm-hmm. Um, the deployment was, was really hard, yeah. um, in, in a lot of ways, um, uh, and so I, I can't imagine um, having been the person in harm's way or, mm-hmm. um, you know, in, in that kind of life or death situation. And, and so I think we owe it um, to veterans to uh, be helpful to them, especially when they experience hard times. Um, it's hard enough as a wife um, sitting at home in Indianapolis. I can't imagine, you know, being on the ground. Mm-hmm. How did you work through that fear because I know you said you weren't a good military but I feel like that's probably how everyone is that they probably just hide it better you know so you're you're being authentic and real about that so how how did you work through it if you could I I don't think I did um mm-hmm. uh, I don't know if you guys did this um but I kept a t-shirt that Jay had worn before he left and I didn't wash it and I kept it under his pillow and um he worked 12 hour shifts. And so depending on what time it was, like sometimes he would call and it'd be like 2 AM and he didn't want to do it. He wanted me to mm-hmm. sleep. And I was like, no, like I, like I have to connect with you. I have yeah. to know you're okay. Let's yeah. do this. Yeah. Um, I think the only time we didn't talk was actually armed forces day of 2012. And I was at the Indianapolis motor speedway with Senator Luger and I hadn't heard from Jay. And so I, you know, kept sending emails, but, um, what had happened is there had been a death of someone at the base and they close, uh, they cut off all the communications so that, oh. that the family gets notified through the official channels. Um, but in your, in your head, you can't like get there. Right. So it's just like, are you okay? Are you okay? Are mm-hmm. you okay? Um, so I'm not sure I ever really worked through it. Um, I lost a lot of sleep. Um, mm-hmm. and it's, I mean, it's just, it's hard on, on you personally, but, um, we, we made it. Yeah. How would you say that it's probably then made your marriage stronger going through that? Um, I, I think you just realize what's really important. Mm-hmm. Um, we uh, exchanged letters before he left um, and just kind of realize like how um, deeply you love each other and, mm-hmm. and what's really important. Um, and when you know you can only talk for a little bit every day, um, you know, how do you stay connected? Um a big part of my role I felt like was um, helping him stay connected with the kids because they were so little. Yeah. Um, actually made, I'm not a crafter, but every once in a while um, something comes out that's not bad. Um, <laughs> but I made these little daddy maps. Um, mm-hmm. They look like a Candyland board with little spaces. Um, and I made like a tiny thumbnail of Jay's face. And so the kids would move that, um, you know, closer to home throughout the deployment. Oh, um cool. 
just to like remind them that he is coming back. Um, you know, we, we prayed for him every night at dinner just to kind of, you know, make sure that everybody understood that he's still part of our family and um, yeah. he's just not here right now. Um, he uh, recorded, he's not a singer and he doesn't like any of that, but I asked him to record himself singing happy birthday mm -hmm. to all of the kids um, just so we could keep those connections going. Um, and he did it. Um, so uh, they, they loved it. Um, but Caden, um, the twins turned four while he was in Afghanistan and Caden watched that video and took off running to his bedroom and like cried on his bed. Oh. Um, and I like, it's just heartbreaking, mm -hmm. but like, I thought it was really important. I still think it's important, mm -hmm. but it was, it was tough to do. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool that you could be that support for them and kind of help them through it. And yeah, it sounds like you did some really great things. So yeah. And, uh, Andrea, when, um, I know, when he came home, you've had to, um, process through a lot of his like PTSD, other things like that. Um, so, you know, how have you supported him through that and, um, just any other like issues he had to deal with? Well, so the first thing I think is I had to educate myself about PTSD, mm -hmm. uh, and what it was and how I could help him. Um, I think the biggest thing for me is I, I tried to relieve him of as much stress as I can in, in life. Mm -hmm. Um, just try to be an encouragement, um, for like just his appointments and his, you know, stay on his meds, stay going to his counseling, mm -hmm. um, being on top of those things, um, is very important. Um, I think it's just, it's a lot of praying, mm -hmm. <laughs> honestly, because it's just kind of a lifelong journey. I don't think it's yeah. it's ever going to be like completely like it was before he went to war. Um, but you know, we I noticed like where we are now is so much better than we were two years ago. So much mm -hmm. better we were five years ago. Much better than we were ten years ago. And we'll we'll celebrate our twenty fifth wedding anniversary this year. So mm -hmm. I feel like I'm really proud of him, honestly. Mm -hmm. Um, because it took a lot of courage for him to admit that he needed help. And that is like a mindset, you know, of the military that, you know, you have to be very strong to survive. Mm -hmm. um, but you also have to be very strong to admit that you might need help mm -hmm. from others. And, you know, at first he didn't share about Iraq ever, mm -hmm. <laughs> like never talked about it, never would. But then as he worked through his therapy, you know, he started to share with me and open me up to what he had experienced and what he was going through. And I think that bonded us in a, a very dynamic way. And, um, you know, so I feel like, you know, it's been a lifelong journey, but it's it's something that if I had to do it, no one would probably think this, but if I had to do it all over again, I would, because I feel like it's made me a better person and more compassionate for others and better for this role here mm -hmm. at HVAF. And, um, yeah, so, but it's definitely a day, a daily, a daily thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, Kristen, is there anything with your spouses on PTSD? Any, any, any effects like that after well, military? I just you feel like a lightweight over here. Like, you, <laughs> you ladies are awesome. <laughs> Amazing. So are you. I mean, I would yes. just e echo what Andrea says. Like, it's an adjustment. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, the, the National Guard does uh, homecoming a little bit differently. So when Jay got home from Afghanistan, um, we had just um, a little bit of time, like maybe an hour mm -hmm. or so. And then he went down to Camp Atterbury for several days to kind of go through out processing mm -hmm. um, and all of that. So um, it's, I guess it's a more gradual homecoming a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, so you, you have time to get ready for that. Um, but, you know, Jay has deployed four times. So, um, you know, he's he's sacrificed a lot of time with family and, and kind of doing his activities and um you know, I try to keep that in mind that, mm -hmm. um, things are really special, um, because he's, he's missed some things. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, making sure that we, you know, take a minute and, um, recognize that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And this, um, I have a few questions that open to the group at this point, but so how could, how could someone who is not a military spouse, how could they better understand you or someone who is a military spouse? 
Um, well, uh, my shirt says that uh, I'm an army wife, which is like a normal wife. And I, I really do think that we're, we're normal people. Um, our husbands are willing to, um, serve our country, serve a cause greater than themselves. Um, and they should be celebrated for their service. Um, mm -hmm. I think what's unique about us is that we've had a front row to that. Um, mm -hmm. but I think all three of us working here at HVAF shows that we're also committed to service and serving something greater than ourselves. So, um, you know, I, I would just like people to, to see that, um, especially if you know it's uh, a military spouse whose um, partner is not home, there are lots of ways that you can pitch in and help. Um, maybe they need the yard mode. Mm -hmm. um, maybe they need a, a ride to practice for the kid. Because um, those things can be hard to juggle when you're doing it all by yourself. Yeah. Are there any, like, challenges of being a military spouse that um, you think that maybe other people wouldn't realize? TRICARE. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think that's a challenge, um, which is the, I, the, say, I don't even know what that is. So I definitely don't know the challenge. It's the health insurance <laughs> okay. uh, for uh, members of the military. And it's great. Um, we're really blessed to have it. But there are some kinks that never seem to get worked out. Um, gotcha. Every year when I get a mammogram, uh, TRICARE thinks I've had two mammograms on the same day and they reject it. And oh gosh. <laughs> I've got to call three times to get it all worked out. So oh, that's fun. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any other challenges? The only thing I would say is, and I think you've already kind of touched on it, Amy, but there, you spend a lot of time away from mm -hmm. your spouse when you're in the military. And I think that, like, people think, oh, they're deployed, but there's also trainings and trainings for promotions and trainings for this and trainings for that. So it's like, I, my, especially like when we were active duty, um, I think the four years my husband was active duty, we were actually together a year and a half. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, that, I think that's something that maybe, like, even as a civilian now, like, I, I don't ever want to take for granted that um, my husband is home with me and, 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 you know, he doesn't have to go away for two weeks or four weeks or a year. Or, and so you miss a lot of things like anniversaries and birthdays and things like Christmas and things like that. Mm -hmm. And you would think it gets easier. It is not. Um, mm -hmm. I remember when we were, like, we got married in March, um, so the you know first um, time away was that summer for two weeks, and I got all teary eyed and like oh. But um, last uh, spring, Jay had to go to a week long course in D.C., and I cried when he left then too. Mm -hmm. So it, it doesn't get any easier, um, but it, it it is part of the gig. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What What would you say is your favorite memory of being a, a military spouse? Or just it doesn't have to be a memory, even just like your favorite favorite part of being a military spouse. Well, I think being proud mm -hmm. of your spouse mm -hmm. um, yeah. or whoever may have served your partner um, is a lot because they have sacrificed time and mm -hmm. energy and missed a lot of things. Yeah. Um, so I think just being proud of the service. So I'm very proud of Neil for his service. For me, it's very it's very easy to answer this question. It was get to, got to be to live in Europe <laughs> for three years. Yeah. So I got to, which my favorite place on the entire earth is Venice, Italy, um, and got to got to go to Venice and uh, all places that I would have never probably ever went to. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a that was a big bonus. <laughs> Uh, I think my favorite memory is when Jay got home from Afghanistan. And the whole time I worked for Senator Luger, I had been part of departure and homecoming ceremonies mm -hmm. for thousands of guardsmen around the state. Um, it was the height of the global war on terror. So um, there were lots of flights that I was out on the tarmac, shaking hands, welcoming people home. Uh, but I no longer worked for Senator Luger when Jay got home. He got home um, the end of November 2012. But I was like, you know what? I have not asked for favors ever. I'm going to call in this one favor and yeah. ask if I can be at the bottom of the plane ramp when they get home. Um, and so uh, General Umbarger, the head of the guard at the time, was like, absolutely. You've done this, you know, a hundred times. Like, you should be there for your husband. And I thought I had conveyed that it was going to be a surprise. But um, General Umbarger, when Jay got off, said, I think there's somebody here you want to see. And I was maybe three or four people down. So um, it wasn't as surprised as I thought it would be. But the guard photographer at the time um, snapped a picture of it. Um, so uh, you, what you can't really, oh, there you can see, I'm, I'm wearing the reflective belt. So no, nothing <laughs> hits me. Um, 
but it was it was really special to yeah. to document that moment um, because he'd been gone since January, so mm-hmm. it was a long time coming. Yeah. Oh, Did you that. make a sign, Amy? No. <laughs> uh, when my husband came home, he it was a little different. He didn't come home with the unit because he was ETSing, which means sorry, it means that the service time is ending. And so um, I was at the uh, Colorado like airport, Denver, Denver airport. And so all these civilians were around me, like, and they saw that I had a sign, you know, and I was like, oh, my husband's coming back from Iraq. So they literally did, like, all clap when he got off the plane, and he spun me around in a circle at the airport. (laughs) Oh, yeah, I know Emmy would love that attention. (laughs) Yeah, I would hate that, and Jay would be mortified as well. So, no, there are no signs. Um, There's There's love. You can see in the photo a little, yeah, a a lot of love and a a little bit of... uh, uh, tears in our mm-hmm. eyes because um, it, it, like I said, it had been a long time coming. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Yeah, oh, I love that. If there's someone who's listening right now who, you know, their spouse is currently deployed, you know, or they just just became a military spouse, they're not, you know, sure even what they're about to get, you know, get themselves into. <laughs> uh, what are some words of encouragement you'd like to share with them? So I've actually been able to to do this. My nephew Tyler is active duty stationed at Fort Carson, Colorado. Nice. Um, and he has a wife and two boys, um, and he's gone right now. He's at training, so he missed his birthday last week. Um, but it is a really special bond that I have with his wife because mm-hmm. we've kind of both walked in these shoes. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, I just try to encourage her, like, you've got this. You're stronger than you think. Um, you know, at first the days seem really long, and you don't know how you're going to get through two weeks or 30 days or whatever. Um, but you do find your routine, mm-hmm. um, you know, surround yourself with people that care about you. Um, I, I was, th- while she was speaking, I was just thinking about what uh, some of the ladies did, did for me when, when I was in Germany. And, um, you know, I think the biggest thing is that when I, I first went over there, I was, I was really young and I, you know, I was, I just, I just focused on like that moment and it was going to be forever and everything. Mm-hmm. But I think Amy's right. Like, they got me involved in a little scrapbooking club because this I'm old and that was what people did back then. <laughs> and um, so all of us moms, well, all of us ladies, I should say, not all of us were moms. I wasn't a mom but at the time. But um, we would get together and we would just scrapbook like um, like because we were in a foreign country. So we had lots of pictures and and, you know, that really did help pass the time and um, and make me feel like I was part of a family. And so I think trying to accomplish maybe some things that you would put off Mm -hmm. if your spouse was with you, like focusing on that, a project or a personal like hobby or a goal that you would normally not do is probably a good way to help pass time, especially when they're, when they're gone. Mm -hmm. Well, um, not having had deployment, but in general for women to support women, Mm -hmm. um, other spouses, uh, to give yourself grace and others grace because we're not always our best self, um, but we try to be, and we try to be strong. And think. Anything else you think I missed? Anything important about this topic? I think that, like, I think a lot of times uh, military wives may not feel like they're a good military wife because I felt the same way, I mean, but I just think about, like, these the time that you have just makes you, like, a strong person, I think. And strong for others, and so out of every situation, you can it, there can be good that comes out of it. And I think I have the greatest respect for obviously military, but also their their wives, mm-hmm. and their spouses because I know that there's a that there's a big sacrifice for them too. Mm-hmm. And whenever I meet another military wife, I'm or or you know it's not always just mm-hmm. wives; it can be husbands too. Um, I'm always like, oh wow, I feel this connection because yeah. I'm like you get it, you know, you know the sacrifice. And so uh, thank you, ladies, Thank you, by the way. Ladies. <laughs> I'm really, really glad to work beside you and know that, you know, you're, 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 you've, ex- you, you get it. <laughs> yeah, I want to thank you again for, for your sacrifice and your own service for the, for our country and for taking time to talk with me today and share more about, um, you know, this topic. Because, yeah, like I said, I, I'm not a military spouse, so I learned a lot. So, um, yeah, and I feel like I have a new respect for each of you guys. So there's a lot I didn't lo- I didn't know. So thank you. All right, that wraps up this episode of Roger That. Thank you so much for listening. 
If you haven't already, please be sure to subscribe to Roger That on wherever you get your podcasts. And be sure to follow us on social media at HVAF of Indiana. And for even more stories on HVAF and the veterans that we serve, check out our blog on our website at HVAF.org. Thank you. And until no hero is homeless, we'll see you next time on Roger That, a podcast presented by HVAF of Indiana.